Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. This is our fifth of our six cafe size this summer. We've got a number of supporters in the audience too, and I want to thank you all for all you do to support the work that we do. I especially want to thank what's the next one, um, H and Payson. So H and Payson, we've had a long-term partnership with them. They're awesome. Um, Chris Flower's son works for H and Payson, which is probably why H and Payson has been sticking with us forever. Chris and Deasy Flower. He was one of the people that raised his hand. So they support this, the Cafe Size Series every year, and we're so grateful for them. They are a main financial company. Next one. Next one. Um, so for those of you, we've got a number of people, um, actually quite a few people online. So if you, which I should be standing over here, you would think I would have learned how to do this. It's the fifth time. So for those of you online, if there are any questions you have, you can put them in the hit the question and answer button and we will take a break midway through and at the end and we'll answer those questions. And for those of you here, if you have any questions, we'll be walking around with the microphone so you can ask them. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Lomas. So Mike Lomas runs, um, he's got a number of titles here. He's a senior research scientist. He's the director of the National Center for Marine Algae and Microbiota which is kind of the seed, um, seed lab for ocean microbes for the United States. And in our last strategic plan, we re really wanted to think deeply and effectively about how we can use algae um, at, for commercial products. Because if we can transition to an economy that uses algae more than building things in giant uh, fossil fuel powered factories, we can get a long way to some of our climate solutions. And so Mike, um, leads the Center for Algal Innovation to push that kind of work forward. And um, he is also, I've known Mike for a very long time. Um, we actually are academic siblings. Our, we got our PhDs with the same advisor, although we did not overlap. And I am older, so I got, so um, <laughs> even though I wish I wasn't older, but I am. And uh, we did not overlap, but he is um, just a, a very well-respected plankton ecologist, um, nitrogen biogeochemist, and he has this whole other area of research that he is known for within the oceanographic community, other than what he's going to talk about today, which is just pretty shocking. And with that, I give you um, Mike Loomis. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie, especially for not saying how many decades we've known each other. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. So um, in the next two blocks of 20 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about, as Debbie said, the, the centers that I direct and the way in which we use them to leverage business and academic partnerships to drive a blue economy. So why am I here? Because Debbie said that I'm an oceanographer as well on, um, in the past and part time. For three decades or so, roughly speaking, I've been studying how algae work for us as society in the oceans, how they control our climate, how they produce the oxygen we breathe, how they support the fisheries that we enjoy. But in that process, I've had some great opportunities, spending eight weeks at sea on an icebreaker, listening to the repetitive crack bang thumb as we're going through ice, Intentionally chasing storms where the whole goal is to actually find those storm events that create 30 foot waves that wash over the stern of the vessel because we want to know what mixing does in the ocean. And meeting and working with an amazing group of people. The problem is, is through all of that 30 years of science, I found it difficult to convey the, the, the importance of it because it's so intangible. This is just one example of the complicated mess that is oceanography. And to try to explain this is 30 years of science, and I'm never going to be able to do it in the next 40. So what I'm going to do is rather talk to you about the motivation over the last decade of how I've been trying to rethink how algae can actually work for society, but now something much closer to home, much closer to each of us. And that's how we can use algae to create products or be used in processes that we touch and feel every day. For example, green chemicals in the foods we may eat or the products we put on our skin, bioplastics to replace the synthetic versions. I grew up where Dow Chemicals tagline was better living through chemistry. Yes, but we can use algae for that chemistry as opposed to test tubes and flasks. Health supplements, looking at processes like 
bioremediation, bioenergy, carbon capture. So I'm going to talk about these things of how this drives me to keep thinking how we work with businesses. So to start, I should just get everybody on the same page that when I use the term algae, I mean both microalgae and macroalgae. Microalgae are the algae you cannot see individual cells with the unaided eye, but you see their effects. For example, a harmful algal blooms are commonly driven by microalgae. Um, the food that we use to grow shellfish in aquaculture scenarios, that's microalgae. So you can see the water's colored, but you can't see the individual cells for the most part. That slime on the rocks when you're looking through the intertidal pools along the coast of Maine, many of the things that make up that slime coat are microalgae. Macroalgae, in contrast, you can see, right? They are the kelps, the rockweeds, the ulvas, things of that nature. So... With that definition of algae out there, show of hands, pop quiz, who thinks they could name five products that are made out of algae or algae is included in making? Seriously, <laughs> okay, well, all right. So this will make this quick. <laughs> um, so one of the common things, right? Again, being as old as I need to be, Remember GNC, producing spirulina, this superfood where they pressed it into these pills. Well, now pills are out of fad, so we put it in our smoothies. Or if you're in Europe, they actually will make burgers out of it, you know, spirulina burgers. That's a common one probably people have seen in some shape or form. Kelp as a direct form of food. If you like sushi, you're eating kelp, you're eating seaweed, macroalgae. These two examples here, the kelp uh, bottle and the kelp in the bag, those are actually kelp harvested from the coast of Maine by Maine companies and then sold in some of our local supermarkets. If you use toothpaste or you like ice cream, which I hope is everybody in the room, you are using a product that actually has an extract from algae in it, carrageenan. Um, as we get older, we need nutritional supplements to keep us going, to keep us looking young and beautiful. A lot of supplements will come from microalgae as well as macroalgae. And if you look close in your supermarket, there's a particular brand of organic milk called Horizon Milk, where their primary benefit is the inclusion of a fatty acid derived from microalgae to fortify the milk. So those are the ones you may know. There's a lot that you probably don't know. Did you know that Algae are included in cosmetics. Actually, Oil of Olay in the 1970s started including algal extracts in their cosmetic creams. If you go to Europe, you will actually find that they extract the blue pigment from a particular type of algae to make blue hamburger buns. It's much nice, or sorry, blue veggie burger buns. It's much nicer when it's the Betty Crocker blue frosting, but I didn't, couldn't find a good picture of that. There's a company in California that actually used al microalgae to produce the basic polymer or plastic monomers to make flip-flops in the cores of surfboards. And when the algae have their blue pigment extracted, they take what's left and they actually make printable ink out of it. That's that living ink. And now we're starting to see that algae are being the is creating uh, or being used to create fiber products for t-shirts and the plastics to make those disposable ponchos that everybody needs at the theme parks when you're there and it's sunny and 10 seconds later it's raining. So those are ones you may not know, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are all kinds of areas that algae can fit into. Biofertilizers and stimulants. These are either extracts of algae or maybe even the algae themselves that can be added to uh, soil to stimulate the growth, the growth of terrestrial crop roots. Aquaculture, this one's probably fairly obvious for Maine. Um, feeding shellfish or being used in the culture of finfish, which I'll talk about as one of my examples later on. There, <laughs> there's industrial biomaterials. So we can use greases and oils synthetically, but we can also make those from algae, for example. As I already mentioned, there's the human health, chemicals, biochemicals, supplements, nutritional things, such as that. 
We can use algae to remediate our wastewater streams, whether they're domestic wastewater or industrial wastewater. One of my favorite uh, paper titles that I was reading was someone was using a green algae to actually extract neodymium from industrial wastewater. Neodymium is one of the things that make computer hard drives work. All of that, that is a particular rare earth element that drives, just like lithium and rubidium and others that drive our technologically dependent society. Maybe we can use algae to actually recycle all of these things. There's food system additives. When I say food system additives here, I mean into direct human food chains. Oftentimes we will use synthetic chemicals to have a function in a food system. We're working with a company to try to find green alternatives to that synthetic chemical that goes into our food chain. Bioenergy, I'm sure everyone equates that with biofuels, but there's also biohydrogen and biogas and lots of other ways we can get energy out of algae. But then there's the flip side of that is that's actually capturing the byproduct of all of our energy production, the carbon dioxide uh, emission and uh, removal and mitigation or the methane removal and mitigation. And I'll just say that uh, hopefully everyone comes out next week for Nicole Price's Cafe Side Talk, where she'll talk about the carbon, uh, the methane um, removal and mitigation work she's doing. So to try to put some numbers on this, every economist has an opinion on what the value of this is. But the, one of the recent ones that seems to encompass many of these topical areas puts this at about $21 billion as the aggregated value of algal activities and products currently expected to grow to almost 50 billion by the end of the decade. So for the rest of my talk, it's gonna be a bit of two parts. It's gonna be thinking about the past and that'll take us to the break, the first break. And then it'll be looking at the future. So to jump into the past, we have to think about how we got here, how I got here, how one of the core centers within Bigelow got here. And that core center is the Bigelow Center for a National Center for Marine Algae and Microbiota that, that, that Debbie introduced as uh, a part of the introduction. Back in the late 1950s, Bob Guillard, one of our founding directors and one of our namesakes for the culture collection, began distributing algal cultures to shellfish aquaculture companies because they didn't want to maintain them. They needed to get them replaced. That's what he did. About 20 years after that, a contemporary of his, Luigi Provasoli from Yale, up and retired and left his collection to Bob. And so Bob, within the course of a couple months, went from 400 strains to almost 1,000 strains. And he realized this is now too big a lift for one person to do. And so very shortly thereafter, Bob was successful with support from the community, the academic community, to get the National Science Foundation to begin to support in part the operation cost of what was then called the Culture Collection for Marine Phytoplankton, but has now been changed uh, name to NCMA. And shortly thereafter, we moved from Woods Hole Oceanographic up here to Bigelow. So the CCMP, if you're you know, my age, if because that's what it was called when I got cultures here as a graduate student, or NCMA, that's been here at Bigelow since the very early 80s. In the early 90s, there was a public law passed by the federal government that actually specifically called us out as the National Marine Algal Culture Collection. I wish that meant we were a line item in the federal budget, but no, we have to beg money from the government just like everybody else. And then in 2011 or 2012, we moved from our old campus to this wonderful campus right down the hallway here. So through all of those changes, all of that time, NCMA's public mandate has always been to curate. That means to keep and maintain and distribute all of these algal strains. We've grown a lot since Bob first started in the late 50s. That comes with costs, and we've been able to take and support that growth by creating other aspects of our operational model. We've developed services or products that are useful to our user community. We've developed education programs where we can help train future um, users of algae or graduate students. I know Debbie and I both got cultures from NCMA when we were graduate students. And we do our own basic research. So just some basic statistics about the collection. We are the most genetically diverse marine algal culture collection 
that genetics term is going to be really important. I'm going to try, I will try to keep it as genetic resources and not slip into a word that I will use that's jargony, but it's the genetic resources in the collection with the most diverse. It began as a seed stock for aquaculture, but we've now expanded into all these other sectors. We started with several hundred strains and now we've got almost 4,000, about 2,600 on microalgae and about 1,300 on macroalgae. On any given year, we may bring in about another 100 strains that either may be new to science or that we think might be commercially viable or relevant going forward. So we make it, you know, a lot of times we make business decisions about what we bring into the collection. About 2,200 of those we perpetually keep in culture. So you could walk into NCMA, you see lots of little test tubes or lots of little boxes that hold them. The rest we actually keep in cryogenic storage, which means they put them in the vapor of liquid nitrogen, which is roughly minus 176 degrees centigrade. These, collect these strains have been collected from all over the world's oceans, some inland coastal saltwater seas, as well as a few freshwater stragglers. We then distribute them back globally. So here are two maps, the United States on the left and the world on the right. If it's color green or some shade of green, we have distributed to that state or to that country. The density of the color green is, is just a scale bar for how many times we distribute it. But basically, we distribute to, on average, in the last year, 37 of the 50 U.S. states and 40 of the roughly 190 or 91 countries around the world. All of that gets, all of that activity, all of that distribution gets um, amplified when academics or even companies are writing about the work they're doing with our algae. This is a graph from the NCMA Google Scholar page that shows from 1991 when data were first started to be collected and curated uh, up to the present of how many times in a year our cultures are cited in a publication or our name, the NCMA name is cited in a year. It averages out to be about currently in the last couple of years, 28 citations in a year. So in the time that I've been talking to you, we, uh, sorry, in a day, which means we now have three or four more citations just in the time I've been talking to you. So all of that activity, the so size, scope, scale, scientific uh, activity that's coming out of our collection is what helps drive global innovation in algae. And this map is just a sort of standard way in which that innovation usually works as academics are driven by curiosity. They do something, they say, gee whiz, isn't that interesting? And they publish something and companies will sit there and they will take and say, hmm, not only is it interesting, but that might be valuable. That I might make a product out of that. And so there's this transition from that curiosity to that innovation and ultimately to a socioeconomic output. I would argue in the past, distant past, or at least not more than 10 years recent, that process has been a bit clogged, in part because companies wanted to control their own knowledge, their own, we call that their intellectual property, because that is the foundation that their companies are valuated upon. And so academics are filling up the top of our funnel here but the companies are forming an effect, sort of a filter, and they're only letting a few that they think can be viable through. Once they do more testing, they realize that becomes even fewer, and then you get a random product or two that comes out. But over the last 10 years or so, we've been seeing some changes that might suggest that model is changing. So this is a graph of since 1995, when our records were digitized, which means that was e easy for me to get my hands on them. I didn't have to look through all the old typewritten reports um, that show the percentage of our cultures that are distributed to companies directly. And so that's that blue set of bars at the bottom. And in the last decade, that's increased substantially. Companies are coming directly to us to get algae upon which they are exploring for product development which is a very big shift because they used to bioprospect all of their own thing because they felt the need to control it entirely right from the get-go. 
Another thing that's changed is we're starting to see more and more co-authored papers. What I mean by that are papers that will have at least one academic person on the author list and one company affiliated person on the author list, suggesting there's a lot more direct, co direct collaboration between companies and academics in whatever topic of algae they're publishing. Also, the federal government is helping here. And I'm just gonna draw your attention to the bottom two lines. These are the darker blue is the amount of funding and the lighter blue is the uh, sort of the seed funding for a program that actually really helps enable the much more direct collaboration between academics and companies. This particular program allows academics to be upwards of half the budget that actually have a formal relationship perhaps already. So that's a set of programs within the federal government that are actually increasing over time, suggesting the federal government is supporting a change in how companies and academics actively work together as opposed to passively rob and steal each other's ideas. And so I would argue that funnel that used to be clogged has now either actively or passively, businesses are moving to the front of the line, to the front of the funnel, they're contributing to those ideas, which and not being gatekeepers, which now allows many more ideas to come through, leading to many more new products or potentially even companies. So as an example of that, um, this more effective and efficient pipeline is business growth. This is data for Western Europe. In the green bars are the number of new companies per year that are formed. And the blue line is the cumulative sum of all the companies that happen to be around for that given year. The US hasn't created a comparable compilation, but some of the initial uh, compilations that I've done suggest that the same thing is happening in the US. But the story holds true that over the last 10, 15 years, there's really been a, a marked jump in the number of new companies that are actually being formed around algae. And I would posit that part of that is because of this change in mindset of how academics and companies work together. That decline post uh, 2016 probably is a bit of a scaling artifact because 2016 was such a productive year from the terms of forming new companies. And so we can't rule out that there are particular spikes in funding or particular initiatives or things like that that may actually lead to spikes in this graph. But overall, there's definitely a lot more company formation and translation of knowledge, academic knowledge out to companies and impacts. And so I think with that, I reached my first 20 minute break. I hope I didn't start my clock on time, but uh, I think I'm close. Questions? We had one online. Uh, what are some of the logistical challenges of keeping the algae and then distributing them around the world? <laughs> um, the, so the question was, was what are the logistical challenges with one, keeping the algae alive and then two, shipping them around the world? That is probably actually our second biggest logistical challenge. Keeping something from overheating as it goes from Maine to the center of Texas is really, really hard. So one of our curators, Mark, he spends a lot of time looking at the weather. We, you know, we've invested heavily in basically getting styrofoam boxes that we will use. We, we realize styrofoam isn't great, but if we have to keep it controlled to go to Texas, we take and go a little bit more to try to do that. If it's just going down the road to Maine somewhere, we'll just take and put it in a FedEx envelope with just a cool pack. So we basically gauge our shipping and our shipping methods by the weather globally. The chart you showed 15, 16, and 17 were pretty much peak years for business and for, what do you think drove that? So, and is it replicable? Yeah, so I think there's two things that drove it. Um, partly it's timing, right? So there was the biofuels initiative that put a lot of money into algae. That created probably that first shoulder. There were a few other initiatives but there's inherently a time lag between when federal governments or investments happen and companies are formed. So I think part of it is a time lag, but embedded on that time lag is federal government investment. And we're starting to see for sure in the US, a lot more federal agency investment. 
that are actually putting more money in there and, and academics are being more creative. And so they're being part of that company formation. And so I think that those are the two reasons why that spike happened. And that could also be why 17, 18 and 19 are tailing off is that they, you know, maybe it's a lack of or the reduction in funding, or maybe it's just that's that lag. Maybe it's a three-year lag between funding and company formation. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I'm. Uh, I'm wondering uh, the samples, the uh, the uh, the algae that you have. Uh, do you have like many different samples of Valeria, sugar kelp? How well characterized are the samples? What do you know about them? Why did you collect them and include them uh, in, in your uh, stock? And like, do you know things like uh, growth, uh, growth uh, hormones and uh, antioxidants and how big the varieties are? Yep. And also what, what life stage do you, do you keep the uh, algae? So because I don't wanna sort of give my whole second half of my talk as part of your answer, <laughs> I will cherry pick a parts of it, right? So which stage? Well, microalgae, basically they just absorb nutrients and light and divide. So they are always in a single cell or a filament. The macroalgae we have, it depends. Some are vegetative and so you'll actually see what you're used to seeing on the shoreline. Our kelps we actually have as gametophytes because they can be bred for trait A, B or C down the road. So depends upon the algae is what form they're kept in. Um, why do we have them? Some of the original ones, you know, like Bob Guillard's original 1956 isolation of a diatom was because he was a scientist and he was curious. There's a lot that we have brought into the collection because of our public mandate. We feel that if it's new to science, newly described, never been seen in a place before, we feel it's our obligation to actually now hold that for in the public trust. So a lot have come in because they're new to science. A lot have also come in because they make some really cool stuff that someone somewhere is actually gonna make a buck off of. A lot of our kelp macro collection that we brought in about a year and a half ago, licensed from Yukon, was for that reason, because there's so much energy going into cat kelp mariculture that being that resource, that place where companies could go or even scientists could go to get it to do new breedings, et cetera, seemed to be right in line with our public mandate, but also a way for us to start to work more directly with macro algal companies. So, and the rest of your questions I'll answer in the next 20 minutes of my talk. <laughs> do you have any examples of genetically modified algae in your collection? And do you see much emphasis in the uh, either research or industry for genetic modification? So the first part of the question is currently, we do not have any genetically engineered algae in the collection, but I suspect that's only a matter of time. And I say that because I've written a large number of letters of support to come to colleagues at universities who are trying to do just that, and they will then need to put them somewhere. And so we would be that somewhere. Um, companies are very interested. Um, and I'll talk about that in the next part of my talk, right? In terms of the business models and making and making a dollar, right? The more you can produce, the more dollars you make. So genetic engineering is a good way to do that. Uh, another question online. A lot of the examples you gave were from Europe and a lot of the data was from Europe. Um, why do you think there's been so much more buy-in for algae innovation in Europe versus the US? Or is that just an artifact of your presentation? <laughs> So how to say this politely, given that I'm a US citizen? Europe's just simply decades ahead of us. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's the answer. You know, European, European uh, countries have been investing in, in algae and big algal initiatives for 10, 15 years. I mean, a couple of the last slides in the next section of my talk, I will talk about an initiative we are trying to lead within the US to try to get us there but the reality is we're just behind Europe. Okay, go. Awesome. So this next part is gonna be a bit of looking to the future. And it's gonna start with what Debbie alluded to in the introduction, which was the launch of our Center for Algal Innovations in the um, 2020 to 2025 strategic plan for Bigelow. The reality is, is that because the National Culture Collection has this very clear 
and as I interpret it, very clear public mandate, we needed a way, we needed an umbrella to do the work that we were planning to do with companies where we might try to commercialize an algae. So we needed a separate entity in which all of that could reside so we could keep separate, separate our public mission and mandate from our commercial and applied aspirations. And as such, the mission for Center for Algal Innovations is to leverage value from the algal culture collection, to connect and support researchers and entrepreneurs, to accelerate innovation and in the translation of knowledge, and to foster growth of a sustainable, ecologically and sound algal value pyramid. So we, the Center for algal, algal Innovations really is focused on business, business partnerships. How do we navigate them? How do we learn how to work in that space? Because my PhD is in biological oceanography, not in, I do not have a business degree, I do not have a law degree, although some days I feel like I should get an honorary one. But um, so the background for this is since I took over as director of NCMA back in the uh, beginning of 2014, there have been about 31 plus or minus projects where we've directly worked with a company in one way, shape, or form. Um, the pie chart here just shows the different areas where these projects would be uh, binned. You know, so we've worked with companies on human foods, on compound testing, where a company will have a proprietary compound that they think will serve some function, perhaps killing harmful algal species or things like that. Biochemical replacements, water remediation, aquaculture. So we've got a reasonably diverse exposure to different businesses, different mindset of said businesses. And overall, this has brought in, roughly speaking, 200, 2 million in contracts over this block of time. So that's the backdrop for the things we've done. To be a bit more specific, the areas we are working in, specifically those areas we are leading projects, where we are the lead and, and we are either looking for a business partner or will be at some point in the future looking for a business partner. Um, one is aquaculture. Um, we do a lot of work with shellfish aquaculture, but we're leading our own development in the area of finfish aquaculture. And that'll be one of the examples I'll talk about in a little bit. Human health and biochemicals, nutraceutical, uh, uh, nutritional supplements, potential role of algae as sources of anti-cancer, antimicrobial, antiviral compounds, things like that. That's an area we're co-leading with another main institution. Um, environmental bioremediation. Again, that gets back to how we can use algae to clean the water that comes out of our households, out of our, out of our factories, et cetera. How do we take and explore all, all of that? Sorry, I just sort of blew blow. <laughs> but there's also two other areas where we are sort of that... Um, we are supporting the business that's leading that product, that collaboration. One is in the biofertilizer, biostimulant space, Ocean Organics, just up the road of peace in Waldeboro. There, we are working with them where they're leading a project where we might actually be able to use algae to supplement their business model of, of basically growing turf grasses or other agricultural crops. The other one is working in the human food system space where the company has contracted us. They are a multinational, I don't know, I think their last uh, report was like worth $26 billion or some number I'll never have. But they're looking at how to get into algae, but don't want to sort of start an algae lab themselves. So they're basically contracting us to be their algae lab. And so we're working on how we can create compounds that have either a function or a particular uh, use in, out in human food systems. So with that context in the background and which areas we're working in, I'm going to give you three examples of different types of business partnership models or this BPM that I use um, in which we're engaged. And I just list them here so you can see them uh, right from the outset. And they're based upon the kinds of questions or the kinds of asks or converse that we get from companies when we go to various trade shows or when they drop that random email and said, I heard you do this, right? So the first one we're going to start with is things that fall into this category. I know there is something really exciting there, but I don't know what or where it is yet. 
One could be cynical and call this a fishing expedition, right? Because we know it's there. We just, it's not, it's called fishing for a reason. It's not called catching. Um, so this is an example of a chart of a sometimes called a heat map, but a chart where across from left to right, every column is a specific compound produced by algae. And each row is a different algae. So basically you create this lookup table between compounds and algal types. And I should have said that I can't give you the details because many of these things, because the projects, because they're with businesses are under confidentiality agreements. So I have to use these general examples of, of what these relationships look like. But this is a common one where people want to know all the compounds that algae make and which ones make them so that they can go in and basically look up, in a sense, what they want and where to get it. So I'm going to give you an example. Okadaic acid. Okadaic acid is an enzyme inhibitor. It's used quite commonly to understand intracellular signaling pathways in biomedicine. It's actually isolated from dinoflagellates, which are microalgae. And so in an example like this, if you knew the compound or you saw something interesting, you could go in, you could look at the compound, and then you could look to see which algae has it. And perhaps that's a novel algae. Perhaps it's one that's never been shown to produce it for before. Or maybe it's one that grows better, grows faster, produces more of it, something like that, that allows you to be something unique that you may then be able to develop a business model around on the production side of things. The benefits of this are that once you create this table, you've got that data, right? You can say, okay, these three months, it's going to be this compound. The next three months, it's going to be this, that compound. I've got an intern. Go look and dig. Tell me the coolest thing, right? It's data that you can put your hands on and you can keep going back and mine it forever. And given the fact that algae produce thousands of compounds, quite literally, these are lifetimes worth of work that one could do. The challenge is this is not cheap. <laughs> it costs a lot of money to do these activities. And because it's starting from the point of view of, I know there's something there, but I don't know what or where, most of the new startup companies for algae don't have the financial wherewithal to actually do this kind of work. So by default, you're sort of, this approach is coming from those big multi-billion dollar conglomerates that have very large R&D budgets to basically go down this path. So the second one are things that fall under that category of, I know what I'm looking for, I know what compound it is, I know what I want to, I know what I want to find, but I just don't know where to find it. Where in the algal life do I find it? And so I'm going to give you two examples. One is less extreme, but still economically important, and the other is much more extreme. And I should say for these two examples, in all cases, the algae that I'm going to be talking about were all grown under the same environmental conditions. So the differences you see and that I'll be talking about are because of the underlying genetics of the organism, which is why it's important that to have algae as a genetic resource center, and I'll, I'll sort of keep coming back to that a few times over the rest of the talk. So this first example is a strain of a genera of algae called pavlova. It's commonly used in aquaculture. It's pretty common all over the global ocean. What's unique about it is it produces a very specific fatty acid profile that several companies have been very, very interested in replicating. And so they came to us and say, okay, I know what the fatty acid profile is, but I don't know which algae have it. So we suggested to them that well, this genera, Pavlova, has that profile. Let's look into it. Oftentimes, in that first example, there'll be just one representative of a particular species. Here, in this example, we have 10 representatives of that genus of Pavlova, and so we screen them all. And so what we can see is, for example, number seven has the lowest amount of all 10, and number nine has the highest. If you are trying to create a business and a financial model where you're producing a fatty acid for a nutritional supplement, producing it more and faster is key. So if you happen to only have data for strain seven, 
you might scratch your head and say, well, that's just not going to be financially viable. But if you had the data for nine, you might actually come up with different conclusions. So understanding that they are all genetically different, even though taxonomically they're the same. This next example is a bit more stark. It's much more binary in that sense. This is a company approached us. They were looking for the compound beta cytosterol. Beta cytosterol is a cholesterol inhibitor. It is also a putative anti-cancer agent, um, specifically for prostate cancer. And so we took the same approach. Was like we kind of knew where the compounds would, what we knew, generally speaking, from our own knowledge, where to look for the compounds. So we looked into this particular genus and species called Heterocapsa, Heterosigma acaciuo. This case, we had 12 of them, and six of them didn't really produce it at all, but the rest actually had amazingly high levels. So again, it's that same thing. If you only had one representative in your fishing expedition, just like when you go fishing, you catch that six inch bass, but you know there's a 16 incher in there somewhere, right? Depending upon which one you choose, you may make a, um, you may go down a wrong hole or may go down the right hole from a business point of view. The third one is I know which algae can provide the particular function or compound that I want, but what about the cost? How do I actually make it financially viable? And so this example is an example that we ourselves are leading. This is in the area of finfish aquaculture. Show of hands who like salmon? Awesome. Future customers. Um, so what makes them invaluable is the presence of a particular compound called astaxanthin. It's what makes the salmon flesh those shades of pink. Producing it naturally from algae is really expensive, which means almost all aquaculture facilities use a synthetic version, basically, you know, dye in a flask, which is why the labels have to say color added because it really is a dye. Um, it doesn't function the same way. It's not as bioavailable. It doesn't provide all the same human health benefits as if it were naturally produced, but it's only one fifth the cost. So if you've got a business model, you go with the cheap thing more often. But we know that salmon can get this naturally from things like krill and shrimp, which have a lot, you know, they have 24 or 1200 units of this compound astaxanthin, whereas salmon only have five. But we know there's a specific green algae that actually produces 40,000 units. If we can find a way to grow that algae effectively and efficiently and put it back into salmon feed, we can replace the synthetic version and perhaps do it cost effectively. The challenge, that algae only produces it when you've really irritated it, right? When you've stressed it out. And as a result, it makes a cyst. That cyst survives the salmon gut. So quite literally, 80% of what goes in one end goes out the other. So you have to put in a lot to just at that little bit. We are pursuing a project where we know something about the biology of this organism, where we think we can take and do it better, improve that retention efficiency. So we have chosen to self-fund this project. And so we are moving it along. Um, in the process, we've learned a lot about how to think from the end back. We've learned a lot about how to file provisional patents. We've learned a lot about how to think of how we can position ourselves for licensing this, licensing this once we get there. So this is not a business partnership yet, but I hope we will get to a business partnership. And so that'll be another way in which we translate dollars back into the institution and the, and the core facilities. So the benefits are all of those things. The challenges are, you got to pay for it, right? When you choose to sell fun things, where's the money going to come from? Oftentimes, people say, well, go to grants. Well, this might be a bit too applied for many grants. And even if there is one that you can apply for, this now counts as a disclosure. And now you've got a very defined, strict timeline to get your stuff done. And that's not always the case. <laughs> and so that's a challenge is when you start to take and make these presentations or you make these disclosures, that sets a clock that you may, whether you like it or not, you have to live up to or else you lose it. So, so those are those three broad categories of business partnerships and how those develop based upon what companies are asking for. I also want to take and give sort of some general overviews of um, some of these business partnership model challenges. 
And what will pop up here are a topic, a challenge on the left, and then sort of how a public sponsored research entity, an academic, and a business sponsored research, a company would view all of those challenges. So transparency, exactly what I was just talking about, whether or not you can yak about it at the coffee pot or the soda or the water fountain or whatever. Public sponsored, they actually, you need to do that. You are required to tell the government how you're spending your money, right? You have to talk about it. Businesses, you can't because almost all of them are covered by a confidentiality, a confidentiality agreement of some form. The research pace. I admit, I'm, I'm a 30-year academic. I slowly wander my way through the oceans of the world. You know, if I solve it too quick, I'm out of a job. Why would I solve it quick? Companies, they want fast. They want to get there because their primary research driver for an academic is curiosity. I'm just curious. I'm going to go here and try this. Companies, they want that outcome. They want that product. They want that product process. And if it's not going to work, they want to know before they put millions of dollars into it. And so that their financial model is like that, right? Academics, right? I mean, those of you who have done academic research, you know, you're okay with writing a bigger budget and sort of doing things that way. Companies, streamlines, no frills, nothing. Just what's the cheapest way to get me my answer, right? So it's fundamentally different philosophy of how you get there and how you pay, to, what it's going to cost to get there. So... Those are some general ones that occur across all of those examples I gave you. There's one specific one that I do want to take and focus a little bit more time on, and that gets back to this intellectual property, right? That's the foundation that values all companies, right? Because they convert that intellectual pro property into value by selling a product or having a process or whatever the case might be. So a couple examples under academic corporate interactions. In some cases, we have simply been paid by a company to do X, Y, or Z. They say, I want you to do this. How much is going to cost? We say, Y dollars. And they say, done. We sign some paperwork. We cash the check. We do the work. They go off their merry way. They own all the IP. That's, that's contract research. That's pretty clear. Sponsored research where they ask our opinion. They want to try to pull some knowledge out of our brains to help them move forward better. How do we actually value what they're pulling out of our heads? That's this in-kind activity. How do I value my time to look through the literature? Or how, how do I value my time or the curator's time to see what we're learning? That's really important because if you don't get that valuation right, either you get hurt because you don't capture as much of the intellectual property value as you could, or if you really undervalue it, Someone could probably take a look and say, huh, you're now giving preferential treatment to company X because you are giving them a subsidy of sorts, which is, again, not really cool to do. Same thing with, can apply to academics. When academics work with academics, this usually happens when there's overlapping skill sets, but where you start from square one being, I want to be. So you're trying to function like a business, but you're really two academic institutions you still have to figure out that valuation of that in kind. So you capture right value for your own institution and you don't run afoul of rules of working with uh, undervaluation and appreciation. So it's not just products, it's not just processes, there's other services. Oftentimes, on, most of this is contract work, but oftentimes companies just want you to do something for them. For example, keep in long-term storage their cultures. This may be because it's part of a risk management strategy to them. It could be as part of a patent filing process. We hold a lot of organisms for other companies so that they don't have to, so they have a backup plan. Oftentimes, they want us to be impartial testers. The value of their product is the ability to say, NCMA tested this, and it works. Ta-da! We are that gold star of testing. And licensing. This is really important because over the last decade, companies aren't always going out and bioprospecting on their own. They're bioprospecting our collection down the hallway, which means we need to be able to license it to them, which gets back to the temporary lawyer's degree. So how do we keep working with businesses to enable the blue economy? Well, 
I would argue that we're going to propose the fourth great evolution in agriculture. First was nomads to farmers. Second was using fertilizers and crop rotations from the 1970s. The third one was biotech. The first one, fourth one, is we're going to get aquatic and we're going to go national. So NCMA has led a large scale National Science Foundation infrastructure proposal called the Algal Library and Genetic Information Network, Algenet, to basically connect the four public algal genetic um, resource centers across the country so that we can function as one unit, so that we can do things in a harmonized way, in a standardized way, especially when it comes to interacting with businesses. So we can take and bring in the right support services, whether it's data scientists from the Rue Institute or educators from the Algae Foundation or protocol developers from Louisiana State to basically make one national US algal endeavor, much like Europe is doing. Why? Well, because within the four existing centers, there's about 10,000 genetic strains of algae. Each one produces thousands of compounds per strain. They all have diverse behaviors and biologies. They all have unique genomes. Some of those genomes are bigger than the human genome. And there's a massive potential for genetic engineering. You add that all up, and that is a huge big data problem if we want to use that knowledge and that resource effectively. So if some of you were here last week for um, Nick Record's big data talk, you can just sort of understand where that's coming from. So part of this activity is to take and build upon what we've already done, but now have a collected coordinated vision going forward to get to data that we can then use to jumpstart the US algal, US specific algal economy. Part of that will be the new Center for Innovation and Education, um, which will be right out that way, where some of our activities will be supported, our education activities and things like that in that new center. So what can you do? Well, you can keep an eye out for those really weird algal products like your blue veggie burger bun. You can come visit NCMA CAI and see what we're doing. We're right down the hallway there. You can actually challenge us with us with thinking about your favorite business proposition, because I'm pretty sure there's a way algae can be used to fix every problem sooner or later. And I would be remiss if I did not take and acknowledge the massive team that sits within NCMA and CAI to do all the actual work, giving me the opportunity to stand here and pontificate with you guys tonight. And with that, I'll end my talk. Can I just say I want to be an academic researcher that can just wander around aimlessly with curiosity and work slow. So <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> which is funny that that came out of Mike Lomas, who is uh, the biggest work workaholic we probably have here. Uh, so we had another question online about NCMAs. How do you source or scope for new strains of interest? And how do you go about adding new species to your collection, especially balancing the strains that you might think might be of interest we know are of interest versus ones that you think might be of interest in the future? Excellent question. So how do we source them? This is where me being an oceanographer helps. I can go to all of my oceanographic friends and it's as simple as sending them a one liter bottle with some liquid in the bottom and say, please collect me on water and send it back. Here's our FedEx code. And then we'll try to isolate things from it, especially if they're going to parts of the ocean where we are thin on isolations. How do we make the decisions? Let's say we're amazingly successful and isolate a lot of things. How do we decide what to keep? Mostly it's driven by science. You know, is it new to science? Is it an organism we may have, but it's from a new region? The other part is we just spent, we, I spent a lot of time looking at publications and seeing all these papers that say, oh, I grew strain X from the coast of India and I extracted it, I put it on a cancer cell and it killed it. Well, if we know what that is, maybe that's worth looking at. And we just find some way to choose our management roles like cryopreservation or, or uh, suboptimal culturing storage as a way to sort of cut the costs of keeping them so we can make minimally impactful financial decisions. I actually have a question. So one of the things that always concerned me is some of the cultures They've been in culture for a very long time. So it could be an open ocean species that is used to living in a desert and we've been feeding it yummy media for years and years. Has anyone done a study to look 
and I don't know, you'd have to go back at preserve samples to try to see how if the genetic changes that long-term culturing. Yep. Does. So there's one example of why of how that problem came, exact problem came to be. There was one specific diatom, Palacia cyrosudinana, that was sequenced back in the early 2000s. It might have even been 2000. Back in 2014 or 15, a postdoc in the lab that actually did the sequencing wrote to us and said, do you sure you've got the right strain? Because they couldn't find half the genes in the original sequencing annotation. They must have evolved because we we're because everything else lined up. So that's one example of where it came to be. Um, that's exactly why we need to develop new tool, more high throughput tools like cryopreservation, because then we can freeze them in whatever condition. One, it doesn't cost as much to maintain them because they're not paying people to transfer them, but then they're not dividing. Microalgae, when they divide, depending upon which ones they are, they may divide once every day or once every three days. The moral of that story is in a year, they will go through almost as many evolutionary divisions as all of humans in all of human history. There's a lot of chance for mutations and loss of genes. So. Uh, thank you, Mike, for a really provocative presentation. Um, as a researcher, I don't usually think of people getting their PhDs as individuals who, as you said, are ready to go and intersect with the business world unless they go right into industry and work for a pharmaceutical company. How does a little jewel of a lab that's internationally known that sits here in East Booth Bay connect with businesses in a way that allow you to have that synergy? How how are you guys doing that and getting sort of those dialogues happening? Is that in scientific meetings or give us a little hint at the secret sauce that gets the stuff going? Well, I don't know if it's a secret sauce or not. Part of it comes from our longevity, right? We've been around as a center for 40 years. So word of mouth is huge, right? There are some folks that now work for companies that may have gone right in that may very well have gotten cultures from us. So there's that word of mouth and that growth. We do participate in the Algal Biomass Organization, which is the U.S. national trade group for algae into products. And so we, we, uh, we, spot, we are a silver member of that, society, of that organization. We have a booth there every year when they do virtual or in-person in meetings. And we talk about it. We answer every email. You know, I can't... Um, I can't say enough about the attention to detail that our curators spend in answering every single question, even if it is to put it to my desk to answer that every single question. And so bedside manner, you can't, you can't beat it, right? So I think all of those things have helped to really make us well-known, well-respected, and, and a lot of these things just happen and they come to us. Can I just say, as a graduate student who promptly killed all of the cultures that NCMA sent me, um, they've been doing this for a long time. They sent me new cultures. They answered all of my questions, and they didn't tell Pat or charge us for any more. So I still hope we do that. I don't want to know about it, but I still <laughs> hope we do that. Um, someone online was asking, uh, you had that map of three or four other um, national sort of culture centers around the country. Mm -hmm. What is the relationship between them, the differences sort of, or what makes NCMA unique in that? Well, we're unique because we're awesome. No, um, seriously. Um, what makes us all unique is that we've all evolved to be tangential with minimum overlaps, right? So we primarily, the overwhelming majority of our strains are marine. The North Carolina collection, the algal resources collection, Marine or freshwater, they only hold harmful algal species, only those algae that produce toxins. We have many of theirs and they have many of ours, but they don't have the benign ones. The, the University of Texas Culture Collection, they have overwhelmingly freshwater ones. The macroalgal uh, center, Alta Seeds, is primarily focused on macroalgal breeding for conservation purposes. So we all share a common language, we all share a common purpose, but we're not sitting on top of each other, which actually allows us to all work together quite effectively. We also have Mike Lomas. So when they thought about doing a national program, 
it was really clear who should lead that. And that was Mike. So I'm going to brag on my, on Mike. Okay. Any other questions? So thank you so much. Mike. Thank you everyone.